Good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's indeed good to be able to be with you all. And uh, I'm very honored to be able to bring you another message from, from the Word of God. Uh, hopefully my voice doesn't give out. Ragweed is really playing the devil with my my voice. So hopefully it doesn't give out on me. Hopefully you can hear me in the back okay. Uh, yeah, hey, so much stuff going on in the world. And again, I was casting around uh, all over the place trying to figure out what in the world I was going to talk about. There are so many things going on that I would like to talk about, but they're volatile. And if anything in the world we ought to be doing is drawing together closer as Christians instead of introducing something that's volatile that really doesn't have a thing in the world to do with our salvation. So I left those squarely alone right where they need to be. And I decided that I would address something that was left over from the last sermon that I did. The last time I talked to you, I brought a message about Christian stewardship of the earth and of the gospel. And if you remember, there were there were that was only two of the four topics that I had considered when I was putting that together in the first place. The total four topics that I considered were the Christian stewardship of the earth, Christian stewardship and operation of the church, Christian stewardship and the helping of the needy, and Christian stewardship and the gospel. So there were four things. We only covered two of those the last time. We began the lesson last time by defining just what a steward is. A steward is defined as a person who manages something another person's owns, be it property or financial affairs. And in the Bible, a steward was not the owner of the assets, which is st still true today, but was a responsible administrator of the owner's property. Now, there's two very important words in that definition. One of them is something, right? In the Bible, a steward was not the owner of the assets he but was a responsible administrator of the owner's property. And a steward is defined as someone who manages something that another person owns, uh, be it property or financial affairs. So there's two very important words in that definition. One of them is something, and the other one is responsibility. The something is owned by somebody else. That's clear in the definition. The motive behind stewardship is rooted in the relationship with the owner. OK, you're motivated to do what is right for the owner. And the definition of your responsibility comes from that owner. This morning, I want to talk with you about the other two topics in relation to our responsibilities. Our responsibilities, not stewardship this time, but responsibilities as Christian. I'm talking about responsibility because we already know that we have the assignment of stewardship to these activities. I want to look at some um, some of the responsibilities, and these are basic basic things, folks. I'm not going to try to dig into depth on everything in here. We'd be here all day, and I'm sure a lot of you wouldn't, wouldn't care much for me to talk about. Them. So we're not going to do that. We're going to look at very basic things. So for the first part of that, for the operation of the church, when I say operation of the church, I'm not necessarily talk about what we're doing today. I'm talking about operation of the church as we are Christians, our interaction with each other and interaction with the world, right? And so I'm going to use for that particular uh, topic right there, major topic, Ephesians 4. So we'll be using that as our lesson topic, text for the topic. I'd like to read that for you. Beginning in Ephesians 4.1, uh, and this is from the uh, New English Translation. I, therefore, the prisoner for the Lord, urge you to live worthily of the calling of which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, and putting up with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, and just as you too were called to the one hope of the calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. 
Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he captured captives, he gave gifts to men. Now, what is the meaning of he ascended, except that he also descended to the lower regions, namely the earth? He, the very one who descended, is also the one who ascended from above all the heavens in order to fill all things. And he himself gave some to the, as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, that is to build up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, a mature person attaining to the measurement of Christ's full stature. So we no longer to be children tossed back and forth by waves and carried about by every wind of teaching by the trickery of people who craftily carry out their deceitful schemes. But practicing the truth in love, we will in all things grow into Christ, who is the head. For from him, the whole body, the whole body grows, fitted and held together through every supporting ligament, that as each one does its part, the body builds itself up in love. So I say this and insist in the Lord that you are no longer to live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. Because they are callous, they have given themselves over to indecency for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ like this. If indeed you heard about him and were taught in him, just as the truth is in Jesus. You were taught with reference to your former way of life to lay aside the old man who is being corrupted in accordance with deceitful desires to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new man who has been created in God's image in righteousness and holiness that comes from faith. Therefore, having laid aside all false, the falsehood, each one of you speak truth with his neighbor because we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin and do not let the sun go down on the cause of your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. The one who steals must steal no longer. Instead, he must labor, doing good with his own hands, so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. You must let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only what is beneficial for the building up of the one in need, that it would give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You must put away all bitterness, anger, wrath, quarreling, and slanderous talk, indeed all malice. Instead, be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. Now, like I mentioned, the operation of the church that I'm addressing here is the interaction with Christians with each other, and, and again, I would argue in, in most, most cases, the world. The qualifications and operation of the responsibilities of elders and deacons is not discussed here, although the thoughts above that, we, that uh, we're going to be talking about are just as applicable to them as it would be to any Christian. Here are the key messages I get from this chapter related to the responsibilities of Christian members in our daily living. We're to live worthy of the calling. That's Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. We're to have the empathy necessary to be able to put ourselves in another person's shoes to understand what they're going through. And folks, that ain't easy sometimes. Because people, if you haven't went through it, it's very difficult to put yourself in another's shoes. It takes some work on our part to do that. We're to treat each other with respect. Not, to skin, not condescending, but rather in love. So we're to treat each other with respect, not con condescending, but rather with love. That may be demonstrated by simply listening sympathetically and holding someone's hand while they talk. Sometimes you don't have to say anything to people. It's enough that they know that you're there just to touch them. It may be that someone helping someone with a task that you know they would never ask you to do. You know, some people, and, and I, I hate to say it, but I am that way myself, are pretty prideful about things. 
they want to be able to do. They want to be able to do it themselves if they can. And some of us are so prideful we won't ask for it. And uh, believe me, I've had times where uh, we've had folks that have helped us, and you guys know who I'm talking about. Uh, when pride was not an issue, we generally couldn't do anything for ourselves. Or it may be simply sitting with someone in silence while they grieve. You don't have to say a word. As Piglet asked Pooh, we'll be friends forever, won't we, Pooh? As Piglet, even longer. You may ask, what about people who have wronged us? Well, that's an important question to ask, but I, I'm not going to address that this morning. I'm trying to look at the roots of our basic responsibilities. And the topic of being wronged is, is something that's best left for an advanced study on discipline within the church. And I'm not ready to, to do that here. And I might not even be the right person to do that. But that's best to handle there. We must let people know that, there will always, that we will always be there, demonstrating the love and the unity in Christ that we're all expected to have for each other. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to live worthily of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, putting up with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. The next thing I got out of that is he gave gifts to all of us, and we're expected to use them. That's Ephesians 4, 11 through 14. Each and every one of us has been given a unique gift by God that makes us better at whatever our particular talent is than anyone else. You may not think it, but I guarantee you, you have something you can do that I can't, or I would never be able to do it as well as you can. Examples, I'm going to give you a couple examples here. My brother-in-law, Kenny Schaefer, if you ever watched him, bless his heart, he was a an elder in the church back home. And uh, as an elder, you're expected to teach and to preach. And poor old Kenny would get up and he would try to do the Lord's Supper. And there was so much emotion in him. And he had so much trouble with his speech. And Kenny tended to stutter a little bit. And it was an effort for him to get through that. Now, he, you, there was no doubt in, in your mind when you were sitting there watching him. You were rooting for him. You were praying for him. And he knew that he was sincere in what he was doing. But there was nothing he could do about it. It wasn't he didn't love the Lord. He was just doing the best he could at that moment. Now, on the other hand, if you got that man one-on-one -on -one with somebody, I can't tell you how many people he influenced to come to Christ. He could talk to people. And when he was talking to people like that, I never heard any stuttering or anything in his speech like that. He was easy to talk to, and anyone could have a conversation with him about anything. I told Ruth Ann several times that I think Kenny could have talked with Albert Einstein about nuclear physics, and Albert would have left thinking that he knew more than he did right, about it. He was just that good one-on-one -on -one with people. That's a talent I wish I had. I am not that good, but Kenny was, and he proved it many times. There are others who are very good at addressing an audience and in putting together a lesson like this that everyone can relate to and come away with something uh, from the meeting feeling like they actually learned something they can use them. An example of that is someone who stands out to me that uh, some folks in here are familiar with. A fellow was a preacher from Texas named D. Bowman. Now, D., he's since passed away, but he was one of those rare people that uh, I've, I've seen in my lifetime who could motivate a crowd of people and bring a message that was at the same time powerful, relatable, and it could be sometimes funny. I mean, it, would, it was one of those things where when he grabbed your attention at the beginning, you listened and you got something out of it. Uh, you would learn something when you were there, I, I guarantee you. He'd grab your attention, like I said, at the beginning, and he'd never let it go. Uh, one time, when he was visiting with us, uh, when we lived out in Long Beach, visiting with the congregation there, he started a sermon telling us how bad, of all things, he disliked for people to cut their fingernails while he's trying to bring a sermon. 
That bugged him to no end. He said one time, he told the story, he said one time he watched a guy in the in the crowd that was sitting there clipping his fingernails. And he said the guy clipped off a big old chunk of nail that went right into the hair of the gal in front of him. And he was standing up there trying to preach and watch this guy try to pick that big old chunk of fingernail out of this gal's hair while he's trying to preach. Well, he told us how distracting that was. And uh, everybody got a pretty good laugh out of it. But I guarantee you, after that story, everybody's attention was focused squarely on him. And he brought a great lesson. Now, obviously, not all of us are going to be a Kenny Schaefer. Not all of us are going to be a D. Bowman. But I guarantee you, you do have unique skills. Some of us love to write and I'm very good at it. And I can name a couple of people in the audience that are very good at that. Others are good at meeting new people and interacting with them and engaging them. I watched Joe yesterday hand a card to a, a, a waitress there at the place where we ate uh, ate uh, breakfast. Um, there are people that are good at that kind of thing. Still others are great at evangelizing in public places, uh, stores, public events, that kind of thing. No talent is too large or too small when it comes to the cause of Christ. What matters is that we're brave enough. We're brave enough. We're brave enough to use what God has given us to work with. Again, we're all working toward that unity of faith in the Son of God, and we're striving that no one would be left behind. And he himself gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, that is to build up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and the foreknowledge of the Son of God, a mature person attaining to the measure of Christ's full stature. The next point I got out of there, the next thing I got out of it was we're to be wise, not shaken or influenced by misinformation. That's in Ephesians 4.14. We're to be a discerning people. That doesn't mean close-minded or obstinate but rather open-minded, ready to listen, and ready to test what we're being told or shown. We must be willing to search the Scripture, not just to find a particular Scripture that supports an argument, but rather to look at the textual context until we are assured that we really understand how the Scripture applies to what we've been told or sold or shown. Too many times people want to, in, in, the, in the heat of trying to win an argument, they want to go to a particular snippet of Scripture and say that that settles the argument. Oh, was it that simple? It's not that simple. We need to be willing to take a look at what the Bible says, understand the context of it, and see, does this really apply or not? And as Christians, we're going to be confronted with that from time to time, and we've got to be able to engage on that. Ephesians 4.14, so we're no longer to be children tossed uh, back and forth by waves and carried about by every wind of teaching by the trickery of people who craftily carry out their deceitful schemes. So people are going to try to trick you from time to time. I guarantee you. And I can tell you that too. You live as long as, as we have, you're going to run into that someday. Better be able to handle it. We're to grow into Christ. Being a Christian is a lifelong commitment. I don't have to say that. You guys know that. But what does that mean to grow into Christ? Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. It truly is a lifelong commitment. Any older Christian that you talk to, young folks, who reflects on their journey are going to tell you just how much they've changed and grown over the years. Scriptures that we've always been sure meant one thing are sometimes revealed in later life and study to be applicable to something else that we didn't think about at the time or different in meaning entirely than what we previously thought. And I'll tell you, I've ran into that a few times. So don't be surprised if you, if you see it. If we're true to ourselves and to our Savior, the growth process will be done with love and a willingness to change our understanding as we mature. Much of the other points already discussed, our growth, if it's an honest and real growth, promotes the growth promotes the growth of those around us who form the body. That is, the others who are part of the body of Christ. 
But practicing the truth and love, we will in all things grow up in Christ, who is the head. From him, the whole body grows, fitted and held together through every supporting ligament. As each one does his part, the body builds itself up in love. The body, the body, that's us. The body builds itself up in love. Next, we're to live in holiness. That goes without saying. We're to put aside the, the previous carnal life that we live and live lives dedicated to Christ. That means we're to no longer to do those things in life that Christ would not approve of. Okay. It does not mean that we don't interact with people who are not Christians. Jesus did look for sinners. He looked for them when he collected his followers. He sought them out in the world. He went after and made disciples of tax collectors, fishermen, zealots, and women who had less than stellar reputations. He went out and seek, sought these people. He recruited people to him regardless of their walk in life. And that's what we're supposed to be doing too. So if we're ignoring folks like that, um, we're coming up short. And I say we, I'm including me in there too. That doesn't mean that we drift back into a corrupt way of living with our actions. It means simply that we have enough love for someone the desire that they go to heaven too. And we do that by sharing the word of God and the gospel of Jesus with them. Remember the great commission given to the apostles. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Back in Ephesians 4.22. You were taught with reference to your former way of life to lay aside the old man who is being corrupted in accordance with deceitful desires to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new man who has been created in God's image in righteousness and holiness that comes from the truth. The next thing I, I got from that chapter, we're to treat our neighbor with respect. What does that mean? In some areas of the world and in some religions, it's considered okay to lie and be dishonest with people if they are not your people. In the Middle East, they don't think anything about it. They think it's perfectly acceptable to lie to you if you're not a Muslim or if you're not a Christian of a certain faith. They will lie to you and they think it's perfectly acceptable. And unfortunately, I'm not so sure what that kind of mentality is and creeping into this country a little bit, too. I don't know, but it just seems to me like I've seen some of that. Jesus doesn't want us to do that. He expects that we'll be truthful and honest in all our dealings with others, regardless of whether they're Christians or not. This is broad spectrum. This is everybody. He also teaches us not to harbor anger and hatred in our hearts because it damages us. It makes us less of what we're supposed to be. And it doesn't promote the unity that he desires from us. And that is especially true in our dealings with each other as Christians. Ruth Ann and I have made it a point in our dealing with each other. And you folks who are married, you know what I'm talking about here. But we've made it a point not to go to bed angry. Not to go to bed angry with each other. And we've tried our best to make up before we go to bed. I, I'm saying that. I'm going to say that there are probably times we went to bed angry. But we don't allow that anger to become vindictive and to be something that we're remembering forever. We let it go. There's nothing wrong with being angry with each other. But you can't be vindictive about it. You can't keep poking and saying, remember when you, you know, remember when you, you do that, you're causing yourself a lot of damage. You're causing yourself damage. And you're causing your spouse damage. What he, he can, we can expect from letting anger and vindictiveness rule our lives is to damage us in our lives. And again, that is not promoting the unity that Jesus desires for all of us. Therefore, having laid aside falsehood, each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, because we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. 
don't let the sun go down on your cause of your anger. The cause of your anger. You can be angry. Just don't let the sun go down on the cause of it. Keep gigging each other. Don't give the devil an opportunity. Another thing I got from that chapter and from the responsibilities of Christians to each other and to the body. We're to let it go. We're to let it go. What, what in the world does that mean? There's a story that brings that message home. And some of you may have heard it before. Maybe all of you have heard it before, but it's worth repeating. A carpenter who was hired to help a man restore an old farmhouse had just finished his first day on the job. And everything that could go wrong did go wrong. First of all, on his way to work, he had a flat tire that cost him an hour's worth of pay. Then his electric saw broke. And after his work, his old pickup truck refused to start. His new boss volunteered to give him a lift home. And on the way to his house, the carpenter sat in the stone silence as he stared out the window. Yet on arriving, he invited his boss in for a few minutes to meet his family. As they walked toward the front door, the carpenter paused for a moment at a small tree and he touched the tips of the leaves and the branches with his with both hands. When he opened the door, he underwent an amazing transformation. His tanned face was one big smile as he hugged his two small children and he kissed his wife. Afterwards, the man walked his boss out to the car to say thank you. And on their way out of the house, the boss's curiosity got the best of him, and he had to ask the man about the tree on the front porch. He said, I noticed when you came up on the porch before going into your house, you stopped and touched the tree. Why did you do that? Oh, that's my trouble tree, he replied. I know I can't stop from having troubles on the job, but one thing's for sure. My trouble don't belong in the house with my wife and my children. So I just hang them up on the tree every night when I come home. And then in the morning, I pick them up again when I leave. He said, the funny thing is, when I come out in the morning to pick them up, there aren't nearly as many hanging there as there was the night before. We're to let it go. We have the ultimate trouble tree if we choose to use him. Jesus will be our trouble tree anytime we want, if we'll just let him. We can touch him at the end of the day before we open the door to our home and leave our troubles with him. Our life with our family is too short to bring a boatload of home, of strife home at the end of the day to share with our families. We should leave those troubles with Jesus when we enter our homes. Pray about them before going to bed, but not unload them on the rest of the family. Jesus will help us to see the next morning that the problems that looked insurmountable the night before, are much smaller the next day when you get up. And from personal experience, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to bed wondering how we were going to get through some problem or concern, just to realize by the next morning that that problem or concern was not nearly as devastating as I thought it was. Let it go. You must put away all bitterness, wrath, anger, quarreling, slanderous talk, Indeed, all malice. Instead, be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. So that was the, the major topic on our uh, responsibilities as Christians to the body. The second thing is we need to talk about our Christian responsibilities and helping the needy. Now, I didn't go super in-depth on this. Any, By the way, folks, any one of those subtopics, you could take it and, and do a series of, of sermons on them if you wanted to. This is, is a very high level. Well, my lesson text for this comes from several different books. It comes from Matthew 25, Luke 10, Romans 15, and Galatians 6. And I'll give you the references as I go through. Where to help someone when we see them in need. Matthew uh, 25, 35 to 40. Matthew 25 is very clear about this. We have a responsibility to help them as best we can. Now, having said that, I realize that not everyone will have the means or the ability to help every need that a person might have. So we, ha we do have to be careful 
that we give what we can without harming our family too. And we also need to be careful that we're not being grifted. But sometimes that's a matter, for me, that's a matter of prayer. I've given money to people that I'm sure they've went off and probably bought a, a bottle of whatever kind of booze they wanted to get. But I always felt like that I gave out of the goodness of my heart from what I thought God wanted me to do. And they, you know, if they wanted to chose to do it that way, that's on them, not me. But we do need to be careful uh, because our means are all limited in what we can do. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, this is from Matthew 25, 31, and he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be assembled before him and he'll separate the people one from another like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on the right, come, you who are blessed by my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food and I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and, and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. I tell you the truth, just as you have done this for the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you've done it for me. Well, who are the needy? Who are they? Coming from Luke 10, beginning verse 25. Now, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus. You guys know this story. You can probably recite it back to me better than I can read it off the page. Set up to test Jesus, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to them, What is written in the law? How do you understand? The expert said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, You've answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But the expert, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And just who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell in the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went off, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw the injured man, he passed by on the other side. So, too, a Levite, when he came to that place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was traveling came, uh, uh, came to where the injured man was. When he saw him, he felt compassion for him. He went up to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring olive oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever else you spend, I'll repay you when I come back this way. Which of these three do you think became a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the religious law said, The one who showed mercy to him. So Jesus said to him, go and do the same. Clearly, the person in need and our neighbor is anyone who requires assistance in a time of need. Whose responsibility is it to help? Church? As a church? Or individual Christians? Romans 15, 25 through 27, and Galatians 6, 6 through 10, starting with Romans. The beginning of verse 15, uh, uh, chapter 15, verse 25. But now I go to Jerusalem to minister to the saints, for Macedonia and Achaia are pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do this, and indeed they are indebted to the Jerusalem saints. For if Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are obligated also to minister to them in material things. Galatians 6, 6. Now the one who receives instruction in the word must share all things, all good things with the one who teaches it. Do not be deceived. God will not be made a fool. For a person will reap what he sows because the person who sows to his own flesh will reap corruption from the flesh. But the one who sows to the spirit will reap eternal life from the spirit. So we must not grow weary in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not give up. So then whenever we have opportunity, let us do good 
to all people, and especially to those belonging to the family of faith. The responsibility of giving for the church and individual Christians is somewhat different. The example of giving of the church in giving, the church in giving in Romans, indicates that the church is giving towards the needy saints in Jerusalem. That would be other Christians. And there are individual Christian responsibilities is toward both Christians and non-Christians. It's indicated there in Galatians 6. So we have a responsibility to help people to the best that our means will allow us to help them. And our means doesn't necessarily mean drinking, uh, drink, drinking, draining your bank account. Boy, I must have had a bad night. Draining your bank account. It may mean helping them, changing a flat tire for them. If they're having a problem at their, at their place with putting up a gate or something, maybe it's something like that. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to open your checkbook and drain everything you got for it. Okay, so what are the consequences of ignoring the, the needy? And I, you guys know where I'm going with this. Matthew 25, 41 through 46. Then he will say to those on his left, he separated them, goats and, or sheep and goats. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire that's been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not receive me as a guest, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they too will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in person and did not give you what you needed? Then he will answer them, I tell you the truth. Just as you did not do it for the least of these, you did not do it for me. And these will depart into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So clearly we have a great responsibility to help the needy. And there are great expectations from our Lord regarding our duties with some uh, pretty serious penalties if we, if we don't. So we should always be watching for opportunities, I think, to, to help uh, the needy as we can. So we've talked this morning about Christian responsibilities for, uh, for and in relation to the operation of the church. We've talked about our Christian responsibilities in helping the needy. I'm not going to try to take it any farther than just those basic Top level things that we talked about right there, but we could easily do more. For the uh, responsibilities operation of the church were to live worthy of the calling. He gave gifts to us. We're expected to use them. We're to be wise, not shaken in our faith or influenced by misinformation is the lack of another word. We're to grow into Christ. Being a Christian is a lifelong commitment. And for us older folks, Sometimes we have to keep kicking ourselves. We, we don't retire. Christians don't ever retire. You keep learning. You keep building your life to, to Christ. We're to live in holiness. <clears throat> we're to treat our neighbor with respect. And we're to let it go. Let Christ take that problem from you. He'll help you deal with it. I'm not saying that you're going to ignore it the next morning. I'm just telling you the next morning when you get up, you're going to find that you've got a solution or the beginnings of a solution when you do. Our responsibilities in helping the needy were to help someone when we see them in need. And we talked about who are the needy. The needy is whoever our needs are help. Genuinely needs our help. Now, you've got to be careful about grifters. But there, you know, there are people that need our help that we should try to extend that help to. Whose responsibility is it to help? And what is the overall responsibility? Is it the church to help an individual or individual Christians to help an individual? We'll talk about that a little bit. And we talk, also talk a little bit about the consequences of ignoring the needy. Well, there are responsibilities, folks. And sometimes we, uh, we, we kind of forget how, how much we are responsible for. Jesus has said that. That something is owned by someone else. The motive behind stewardship is rooted in the relationship with the owner. You're motivated to do what's right for the owner. And the definition of your responsibility to the owner 
comes from the owner. Jesus owns us. Our responsibility comes from him. That's the lesson I've got for this morning. It wasn't a, uh, a grassroots uh, meeting where we would talk about converting people. Most of, everybody in here is a Christian already. Uh, but if we do save this time here at the end, as a time for people who have need. Remember we talk about needs and being proud about asking about them sometimes? Well, now's a good time if you've got something you need to have uh, prayers of the congregation for or some help that you might need from somebody. Now would be a time that you could do that. We don't necessarily have to do it right now. You can wait until afterwards, but we should be confident in each other and uh, loving enough of each other to be able to ask for that help when we need. That's all I've got for you this morning. If you got any uh, any needs, you can come forward now. Be a good time as we stand and we say. Mm -hmm.